The second generation of Ames assemblies are the fabricated stainless steel bodies. And as the name implies, these assembly bodies were made out of stainless steel tubing that was welded together to come up with a fabricated body. Unlike the earlier generation, which used just plain ferrous iron steel that was either galvanized or epoxy coated. So the stainless steel versions, the double check was called the Model 2000 SS. There was also a Model SE, which we'll talk about in just a second. The Model 3000 SS, which is a double check detector assembly, a corresponding Model SE, which I'll explain in just a minute. Production on these stainless steels began in oh, early 90s. The Model 4000 SS, which is a reduced pressure principle assembly, and the sizes on the 2000 SS and 4000 SS, they did have a 3 quarter through 2 inch version. On the 3000 SS and the 4000 SS, large flange stuff was 2.5 through 10. And they did produce a reduced pressure detector assembly called the Model 5000 SS. The small sizes, again, 3 quarter through 2 inch. Here's a picture of what the RP, the 4000 SS, looked like. Um, double check, looked like this without the relief valve on the bottom. But it was a stainless steel tubing, had the test cocks mounted on the top like this with the relief valve attached from the bottom on the RP version. They had two different versions where the ball valves were external, where they were screwed on by threads on the outside of the body. The earliest version actually had an integral ball valve where the ball valve was inside the body of this. So the extension of the body came all the way out just like that. Again, produced in sizes three quarter through two. Here's what the 4000 SS looked like. Again, the relief valve did mount on the bottom with an external relief valve sensing line. Uh, single access cover from the top, utilizing a groove coupling to get access to both check valves. But the body itself was a fab fabricated stainless steel construction. Now, I mentioned earlier there's an SS and there's a model SE. This is a picture of an SS design. Looks like a, probably a you know, four-inch design. The SS had parts that fit several different sizes. Like on the two and a half through four inch, the same check modules fit all versions of the 4000 SS. And then they had one that fit six inch, and then the second one for 10 inch on the larger sizes. The SE version was one that utilized one check size smaller repair parts than the assembly itself. In other words, a six inch SE would carry four inch SS parts. Four inch SS would carry four inch SS parts. So when you see the SE designation, it was referred to special edition. It was one that had one uh, size smaller parts than the body size, that it, the flanges that it was connected to. So this is what it looks like. Here's a line drawing of the 4000 SS and the smaller, meaning two and a half through six inch smaller sizes. They utilized two cam operated checks. The checks threaded into the body. The eight through 10 inch looked a little bit different and the check mechanisms on them Instead of threading into the body, we're bolted into the body, here being the second check, here being the first check inside the body. The relief valve used on both sizes, two and a half through 10, was the exact same relief valve. So this relief valve is what produced on the two and a half through 10 inch. So let's go ahead and take apart a 4000 SS and see what it looks like inside. In other words, the check assemblies are inside the body, which we'll see in just a minute when I get to the cutaway. Instead of a flange cover like we saw in the fabricated steel, we're using what's called a grooved coupling. Um, groove couplings are becoming more and more popular in the backflow assembly world. Uh, there is a two bolt configuration with a gasket in the middle which we'll take apart in a minute to see how that works. Same issues with the tag where it was bolted onto the cover, um, or onto the body I mean, and could fall off where you'd have to identify the assembly without a tag. External relief valve sensing line coming from the number two test cot going to the relief valve body on the bottom. Um, flanges. On the number two check flange, there's a very important part here. There's a little bolt that sticks out that's welded on the flange. We'll talk about why that's important a little bit later. But as we talked about, it is a flange, I mean a fabricated body, meaning that they take stainless steel tubing, constrict the size down, and then weld pieces together at the different weld points. So because of the thickness of flanges and the thickness of welds, you may have an end-to-end -end dimension over the years. As it got later and later years, they started using more robotic welders, which gave more uniformity and end-to-end -end dimension. Let's go ahead and take one of these apart now. Here's a cutaway of the 4000 SS, um, having to be a four inch style. They do make it two and a half through 10 inch. Double check, they do have a 12 inch version available, but anyway, taking this one apart for the basic constructions of the two and a half through six inch design. And this is what you would see. Now, first thing we're gonna see is I mentioned single access cover for the check valves. Here's my relief valve sensing line. 
To rebuild this assembly, we have to remove the relief valve body from the check body. So I'm going to stand it on its end just to work on it. The relief valve sensing line unscrews. It's a hydraulic hose. You don't have to twist the whole hose. You just turn that fitting and that will come apart. Now at this point, I have to remove the relief valve body from the check body. Before I do that, though, I want to do a little preliminary inspections. First thing I want to do is I want to take my hand and wipe it completely around the outside of this body. This looks like a two-inch tubing, which is basically what it is. But I want to make sure it's perfectly smooth on the outside. I don't want to see any pipe wrench marks, any hammer marks. Again, how does the usual maintenance man fix a flush valve when it's leaking? They take a hammer and hit it. Well, that's what happens sometimes to this assembly. It'll start leaking out the relief valve, which is like this. And you'll see people that have hit it. Now, looking back to what this looks like when it's installed, that relief valve discharge is pointing out in a horizontal fashion. Most assemblies discharge comes straight out of the bottom in a vertical fashion, but you'll see that the discharge, when it's spitting, will come out in a horizontal fashion. So unfortunately, when it spits, it tends to grab people's attention and sometimes back to the ham or something hitting it. Of course, sometimes in a park or some kind of environment like that, just vandalism will have people hitting this for some reason because it sits on the bottom. So anyway, first thing we're going to do is inspect it for no marks or scratches or bents or deformations on the outside. It should be perfectly smooth like the outside of a piece of tubing. Assuming it is, what we want to do now is take a large screwdriver, not like this one, but about a six inch style screwdriver should fit across these bolts in here. And what you should be able to do is hand tight to remove the relief valve. Don't everybody laugh at once because usually it's very tight, usually it needs a pipe wrench because somebody tightened it up before we got here. This is one of those things when we're working on assemblies we have to be careful of. After seeing how we're going to repair it properly, we know how to fix it, but we can't control what the person before us did. And maybe the person before us didn't know how to fix it, and they went and tightened this up and put a pipe wrench on it and you know, snugged it into place. When you see this, it looks like a standard pipe thread, which it actually is, but the assumption is that you need torque or a pipe wrench to tighten that in place. That's not true. This is sealed by an O-ring, which I'll show you real fast, sits right there. So as we know about with an O-ring seal, it only has to be hand tight. So realistically, with a small six inch screwdriver, you should be able to pull this between the two bolts and unscrew it by hand and get it off. Now, the trouble is, as I mentioned, what happens with somebody before us who didn't know what they were doing. Well, first telltale sign will be pipe wrench marks on here. Or another one, sometimes you'll see people put Teflon tape across here. The tape doesn't add to the function of this relief valve sealing at this point. So what we're going to have to look at is see what the engineers gave us. If you'll notice on the relief valve, there are two different flanges. And the outer flange is larger outside diameter than the inner flange on the body. If we have to place a wrench on this to unscrew it because somebody tightened it too much, we can place a wrench on the outside diameter only, which is the cover on the relief valve right here. But hopefully we can get it off with a screwdriver on the bolts. Another thing that's a good is a strap wrench, getting it around the outside, going ahead and remove the relief valve. Again, if it was put on properly, it should come off relatively easy. The bad part is if somebody put it together incorrectly with a pipe wrench or something, now we have to fix somebody else's mistake. So loosen the relief valve, and we'll go ahead and take that off and put it on the side for now. Now, we're going to go ahead and work on the check valves. To get at the check valves, we have to loosen this grooved coupling. A grooved coupling is a single flange on the top, but it's unique in that it has only two bolts. They're used quite extensively in the fire industry and are starting to show up on covers of backflow assemblies because instead of having a flat flange with a gasket like we saw in the fabricated steel versions and all those bolts, we have this clamp that holds this with a gasket around the cover. Gasket comes here, taking that off, the cover will come off, and then the gasket will come off. We'll talk about putting that back together. And we put it together and talk about the intricacies of that particular design. Now what we'd be seeing is two check valves. Obviously we wouldn't have the advantage of a cutaway in the field, but you'd be looking down from the top. There are two check assemblies, our first check on your right, second check on the left. Usually there'll be gate valves you know, bolted right here, so you don't have the ability to see behind these check valves as I do here with the cutaway. So we have to remove these checks out of the body. Now, the check valve is gonna look something like this. Here's a six inch version. This is a four inch version that I have in here. We have a first check that has the cam arm this way, and the second check, which you can see here, has pins on this side. So we're going to see two types of threads. We're going to see a female thread on the first check and a male thread on the second check with the pins in this location. 
So removing the check assemblies from the body. So the first thing we're going to do, like the relief valve, you want to look inside and see where the check valves are mounted. If everything's working properly, we should look down in through the top and see this cam arm, see the cam arm right here, should be in a horizontal pattern like this. It should not be in a vertical pattern like this. If we see this cam arm right here in a vertical position, that means it was put back together incorrectly. You should look to the side, and I'll clip it to the side so you can see what that cam arm looks like on the side, and make sure it's in a horizontal plane. The second check should be in the same configuration. Obviously, with the gate valve bolted here, we can't look through the body and see it. So what I want to do on the second check is mark one of these pegs. Know that this was the peg at the top, and that's where it is so that I can see if that was in a horizontal plane as you see the horizontal plane on the second check here. So I'm going to mark this pin. I'm going to observe this cam. Hopefully, they're both horizontal. Again, the second check I won't know until I take it out. Now, I have to remove the check assemblies from the body for a proper repair, and the only way to remove the checks is they unthread or unscrew out of the body. So what I'm going to get is a small little drift pin, and on the back sides of the check assembly, you'll notice there's an assortment of little holes. Looking down here, you can see there's holes here on the inner circle and on the outer circle of this check mechanism. The holes I want to work with are the outer holes right here. These are the holes that on the thread area will allow me to go ahead and remove it. If I hit on these holes trying to twist this, you see that I'm putting torque on that cam arm and have a good chance of breaking that disc hole. So I want to get my pin over to the hole, and I just want to tap it slightly. In other words, a small little tap, it should only be hand tight. Again, if I say it should only be hand tight, that tells us it should be held in place by an O-ring, which we can see right here, the O-ring that seals that particular check into the body. Now, the trouble is, again, who fixed it last time is the question. Maybe they didn't realize it didn't have to be over torqued because of an O-ring. They think that you know O-rings have to be tight, and what will happen many times is somebody will tighten this in, and they'll get in there with that drift pin, and they just hammer this thing until it's slammed in there as hard as it can be. Not necessary with this design. We'll talk about that when we go to reassemble it. But anyway, I want to get the first check out first, and now I want to remove the second check. With my same little pin, I'm going to get in here and go ahead and move the check assembly. Again, once I get it open, it's going to unscrew. And I go to pull the check out. Problem. What did I do different? First check popped straight out, didn't it? It went straight in here like this and came out. I have to take the first check out first because you can see I have to have room to get the second check out, but it doesn't come out through the top of the body. So what I have to do to get the second check out is rotate it 90 degrees and pull it out from the top. That's the function of that second check. It has to go in this way and then rotate to go in place. If you try to pull it out like this, you're going to be there all day. So go ahead and rotate it 90 degrees. The second check will come out just like that. Now you can check your mark on your pin and make sure that that cam arm was in a vertical orientation, hopefully. Now, Rebuilding these check assemblies, unlike the earlier generation of the fabricated steel where we had to replace a clapper plate, we have to replace the entire check assembly. In other words, to rebuild this assembly with a whole new second check, we throw this one away and get a brand new one. Same with the first check. The checks are not repairable in the field. And when you buy repair parts for this, you'll be buying a whole new first or second check assembly. Now, there are some times when we go to rebuild or we clean a backflow assembly, not a repair, that we may just want to take the check assembly apart because we have some dirt and debris and we want to remove it. There is a way to inspect these check valves to see if we can clean them. The second check is the easiest one because it has a relatively larger cam arm, which allows me to pull it up on the second check because the spring load's a little lighter. And I can get in there and inspect the disc holder, the, the seat, and see if I have any dirt or debris. But the first check, unfortunately, you'll see, has a very short cam arm and a much heavier spring load on that first check, obviously for an RP. So I can't move that particular cam arm with my hands. Remember I told you there was a little nut on the outlet side oh, where is it in this side? On the outlet side of that number two flange. See the bolt sticking down here? That happens to correlate to the same size hole that we see in the first check cam arm, which allows me to put it up through here, and now I can get some leverage to open it up when it's bolted in place, it's a little easier, and now I can open it up and inspect the first check if I wish to, if I'm not replacing it for a repair. Now, I kept mentioning that the check assembly should come out only hand tight, or, or relatively because of the O-ring. And the reason that is has to do with this thread mechanism that you'll see here. Look at the thread on 
this check and look at the thread on that relief valve body. What you're looking at here is what's called a square or Acme thread. In other words, it has a channel for each thread, kind of similar to the thread like you see on an OSNY stem of a gate valve. What you see on here is a more standard pipe thread, which you'll see on a pipe nipple or fitting, a very sharp tapered thread. And this has a lot to do with how the, why this check assembly comes out so easily. In other words, that relief valve body is about a two inch piece of tubing. But if that was a thread on a piece of tube, that'd be about a four inch piece of pipe. There's nobody in this room that could take the four inch piece of pipe and turn it by hand without some kind of huge pipe wrench. Two inch, still same thing, you need a pipe wrench. But this thread is giving us some assistance in our activity. So let's take a look at those threads. Standard pipe thread looks like this. And the corresponding fitting has that same basic reverse shape. Now, when you go to tighten a two inch nipple, let's say you have to have 100 pounds torque to seal it because you have you know, 99 pounds of water pressure. In other words, the function of those two threads interlocking is to have a greater force between these and the pressure that's in the piping that it's containing. containing. So again, 101 pounds here, I have to have at least 100 pounds torque here to get that to seal that pressure inside it. The problem becomes that with a tapered thread like this, because they interlock and they stay binding together and they literally are, are meshed to each other, if it takes 50 pounds torque or 100 pounds torque to seal it today, I come back in a year, it's going to take more torque because these threads literally corrode with each other. That's why I come back a year later, take a two inch nipple apart that we put together relatively easy a year ago. Now it's very hard. We have to use cheater bars or, you know, to get it apart. And that's got to do with the shape of that thread and the way that it interlocks. But what's called the square or Acme thread is completely different. The square thread or acme thread, which is what you see on that check valve, is more like a channel. And like I say, it's similar to the thread you see on an OSNY gate valve. The interlocking threads are similar, like this, of that thread. But when they bind together, if it takes 100 pounds torque to seal it today, I can come back 10 years from now. It'll only take 100 pound torque to remove it, unlike a tapered thread, which gets harder as the years go by. So that's the advantage of this thread, why those check assemblies come out so easily. One, they're using this, this, this square thread or Acme thread. It's sealing with an O-ring, which we've already talked about, why that's important, so that it has the ability to seal when it's only hand tight. This has to have a greater pressure than the, the fluid that it's containing, and it has to have a torque greater than what it's containing, and as longer it goes on, the more the, the threads are harder to remove. So basic difference in types of threads, and that's why we're taking the check assembly apart will be different. Let's go back and look at the checks now. So, if we know where we're dealing with a square or Acme thread, we know that that check assembly coming out should only be hand tight. Back to the premise. Unfortunately, we can't guarantee what people did before us. Now, once we have our new check assemblies, we want to lubricate the O-rings, which means we have to take them off of the check assembly. The O-rings usually attached to the check when you buy it. Very important when you lubricate an O-ring. Take the grease between your fingers, pull the O-ring all the way through, rotating it 360 degrees. Unfortunately, many people will try to lubricate an O-ring, and what they'll do is they'll put it on the body like this, and they'll just take grease and wipe it around the outside like that. Absolutely not. Because all you're doing is, is lubricating that outer edge. The trouble with an O-ring is it can and does spin. So as you rotate it, all you're doing is wiping the grease off. So to lubricate an O-ring properly, you have to take the O-ring off, put the grease between your fingers, and pull the O-ring all the way through its channel. Now, earlier we talked about how an O-ring works. Remember we were talking about that an O-ring has to sit in some type of a slot. The O-ring is compressed 360 degree fashion in that retainer so that when it's compressed, if we have a 360 degree squeeze of that O-ring, most of the slots are a square shape like you see here. This particular design has a little bit different slot. It's what's called a V-slot. And where that O-ring sits like this, as it goes to compress, we have a little bit of problem. In other words, when this one compresses over here, Usually this end will bottom out here like this, and that O-ring will be properly squeezed in the retainer. With the, v or the shape that's not square, the shape that looks like a V or a triangular slot, as it goes to compress, if you're not careful and you over-tighten it, what can happen is the O-ring can squeeze out of the holder similar to this. And when it does that, obviously it becomes a gasket, and now we have to have a greater force than what we're trying to seal, and guess what? The O-ring won't work. So, when we're dealing with this type of slot, it's critical to make sure that when we go to tighten it, that we only tighten it hand tight. So, let's go ahead and put the check assemblies back into the body, ready to rebuild it. So, first thing I do is inspect inside the body. What are we going to look for? Well, it's a stainless steel body. We don't have to worry about coatings. We don't have to worry about any of the other concerns. 
we want to check where our O-ring sits inside here. And as you can see, here's our O-ring slot, and here's where it's going to sit on the back threads over here, making sure that it seals properly. We're going to have to put the second check in first and the first check in second. So go ahead and put the second check in. Again, we have to put it in, rotate it 90 degrees. Now, just as before, I want to know when it's in a horizontal, the cam arm's in a horizontal configuration. And as I go to tighten it in, I can't tell. So I'm going to mark one of the cam arms so I know where horizontal is. So put it in place. As I go ahead and tighten it, I just want to tighten it so it's hand tight. Now, if everything's working fine, that's where it'll stop. That's hand tight inside that body. Cam arm is now in a vertical orientation. And that's hopefully where it will be for you if you're lucky. Because all you have to do once you've got this in hand tight into the assembly is a quarter turn. To get a quarter turn, most of the time you can do it by hand, but take a little arm to make sure you get all the way up to that quarter turn. Again, you can't see the cam arm, but you can see the pin you mark so that the cam arm is horizontal. Quarter turn from there is all that it takes to seal. If that's hand tight and getting it to go just that far, take your drift pin, get it to go that final distance, that quarter turn, that's enough to make that O-ring operate properly, and that's where that cam arm should be. Okay? Now, again, second check, we have the problem because the body's covering it. First check, we're going to go ahead and put it in. But unfortunately, sometimes what happens is this, is that the cam arm is hand tight right there. In other words, it's not tightened yet. It's still loose, but we're already in our horizontal orientation. So when I go ahead and start doing my quarter turn, it goes to vertical. Now I've got a problem because if it stops like this, in this orientation, this particular assembly is not approved. The only way this assembly was approved was when the cam arm was in a horizontal orientation. Why does that matter? Let's take a look. Think about it in the context of water flowing through this check. In other words, this is the orientation it's approved in. If water comes through this check assembly like this, and there was dirt and debris, which is, again, one of the most common causes of a check failure, is that dirt gets in here as the check assembly closes. If this cam arm was in this position, for instance, when the dirt came in here, it would hit this disc holder here and could stay in this lower area here. Now, if that dirt accumulated right here while it was flowing and it went to close, what would happen? you'd have a catastrophic failure where that check could not close. So the reason that it has to be in a horizontal configuration is if now if dirt or debris came through here, the dirt would fall out and the cam arm could close in that position. So that's why it's critical that it has to be in a horizontal is to make sure that the pivot point is out of the way of the water passageway. We don't want it at bottom at 6 o'clock. We want it up this like 3 or 9 o'clock on the clock face so that the hinge point is out of the bottom of the check assembly. That's very, very important to the workings of this assembly, and that's the only orientation that that particular assembly is actually approved in. Why I say that is because if this valve was produced since about, oh, about 2005 on, this check assembly will go in hand tight each time, and it'll stop right, right there, and all you have to do is the quarter turn, and it'll be perfectly tight. The trouble is before about five years ago, unfortunately, before 2005-ish, the check, when they went to weld this flange in here, they would just stick it in there and weld it anywhere. So when I went to screw the check assembly in, this check could turn and stop anywhere on the clock face. The manufacturer realized that was a problem because people were going ahead and tightening it in, and they had a constant problem where the check assemblies were in this configuration, in that vertical, and unfortunately had a lot of failures. So the manufacturer made sure that when they put this piece in here where the disc holders, or the check assembly is flan welded in there, that it was in a position that it would always stop right here and quarter turn would put it that. Now, again, back to previous five years ago. What would happen, you put it in hand tight, and if it stopped right here, suddenly it's horizontal, my quarter turn would take to this point, and now I've got a problem. So the only time that you can go more than a quarter turn is if you have one of the older bodies, which you can't tell by the outside, and what you're going to do is go ahead and put your, your check assembly in hand tight. If for some reason it does not stop like this, like it should, you know that when you know, it goes to the quarter turn, say it stops here. Now you know you're going to go to the quarter turn, you're going to have a problem. You've got to get that pivot point off of that bottom area. 
This is the only time you can go more than a quarter turn. When you have the problem where it is tight after it stops here, go an eighth of a turn beyond the quarter turn. Do not go another full quarter turn. That'll be too much and you'll actually squeeze the O-ring right out of the body. So this is the only time that you can go that eighth of a turn rotation to get it beyond that. The critical point is, is it cannot be in this orientation. It has to be off of that center so that the pivot point is not on the bottom.